All right, thank you very much. So, um, all right, so the good thing about being fourth is that I can so like, you know, adjust my presentation to what's been said. Um, also, I couldn't help noticing that I was the fourth, like a middle-aged, uh, you know, white European balding man. Um, so we have an issue of representativity. <laughs> um, and of course, I will say that, you know, this is very bad to, you know, biases in, in, in data, etc. cetera. Um, so maybe if you can put up the slides. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Yes, so, um, all right, 54. Yeah, so the, so the title is um, is yeah, pretty ambitious, pretty broad. Uh, I very much agree with the fact that we should focus on, on like objectives, like what, what do we want to do, what do we want to achieve. Um, so I wrote like no less than, you know, make data work for development and democracy. So obviously, you know, very ambitious, but I think we, you know, we should, we, we should shoot high, as high as possible. Um, so uh, yes, so you mentioned that I was a, uh, also a political cartoonist. So I will start with a cartoon that I did uh, almost five years ago. Um, so just by just to sort of you know steer some questions and and so like just thoughts. So if you see this this cartoon with this like old older guy saying, "Trust me, I'm a data scientist," and so he's basically looking in the microscope at at people at like. Um, so hopefully you can start sensing what I meant through these cartoons about uh, both like privacy uh, questions, but also like imbalance of power uh, between those who have access to data, knowledge, and resources, and those who do not. And supposedly those would be uh, making better decisions be on behalf of the people that they're they're watching. So it was sort of like you know along those lines um, that I did this this uh, cartoon. And again, it was five years ago, and I think it's still you know quite relevant. Um, so as I said, I was going to change my presentation. So I, I will go much more quickly over the ten, first 10 slides because they're sort of like contextualizing, et cetera, et cetera. And then I will get to the more uh, political and practical uh, aspects or parts of my, of my presentation. And specifically, uh, or in particular, talking about the, the Open Algorithms Project, uh, which is an, an attempt at sort of like doing something in the real world about those, those, those questions. So that's the general uh, context. I won't spend more than 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, NSA, Cambridge Analytica, uh, data is the new oil, is it good, is it bad? Uh, we're doomed. Uh, this, this question of data minimization is, in, is interesting. So it's the, it's the concept or the, or, the, or the notion that you should uh, initially collect as few data as you need, but indeed now we, we know that this is you know, being challenged because we, we collect almost everything. So the question becomes, how long should it be stored? By whom should it be used, uh, accessed, et cetera, et cetera. I would just make one point about also the environmental cost uh, of, of all of this. So like data servers are extremely energy hungry. So there are lots of like issues that we're, we're faced with. Um, but at the same time, um, uh, so as Felix mentioned, um, like we live in this world where there are still vast inequalities, uh, you know, like conflict and crime, and it's not sustained the climate change. Um, so surely we can do better. Uh, and I think data is a very powerful tool, um, like asset, um, yeah, just a, a lever to change uh, the, the 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 outcomes. So the big question is how can we so like save big data from itself, so it's the, the article of a, of a paper by uh, Alex Pentland at MIT, um, who's sort of like, you know, behind a lot of the, the work that, um, that we do as, as, as Datapop and as, uh, as Opal. So can we design better data systems and standards to sort of like fuel a new social contract or new social contracts, um, and, and, and how can we, can we do that? Um, so these were the slides uh, about just, again, you know, some concepts and the context. We live in the information age, so those are some of the key, like main so-called big data uh, that we've talked about. The, those digital breadcrumbs that are like passively emitted and stored by private companies. Um, so in particular, so it's Facebook, it's credit card transactions, sensing data, sensor data, remote sensing, physical sensors, and so on and so forth. So I will focus on what is called what has been you know, talked about quite a bit, so call detail records, CDRs, so the metadata that phone companies uh, collect to bill you, first and foremost, and since then, we've realized over the past almost 10 years 
that there are many other things that could be done with this data, population mapping, understanding, um, like the transmission of diseases, etc. But it, because it's like a bit of a sensor that we have uh, on us at all times. So this is basically what a, a you know a CDR is or are. So their metadata about whom you call, where you are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I won't spend much time on that. So it's very high volumes, uh, highly, high, yeah, um, high, highly dimensional, very personal because it says where you are uh, almost at all times. If you have a GPS, it's like you're being tracked, uh, absolutely, like, like not virtually, but like, like you're really track, tracked. So of course, there are many good applications, uh, and it, it gets to the point about how can we use that for the, you know, the greater good, et cetera. Here in Mexico, there is a project uh, about um, so trying to so like model uh, and and minimize like travel time to clinics in uh, in uh, in Mexico because it's the kind of thing things that would be very hard to do if you didn't have those kinds of data you would have to do a survey it would be very expensive etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's one of the good like applications there are there are many more uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit but I'll go yeah as I say quickly about so like the limits of anonymization and anonymity, uh, five, six, maybe years ago, uh, the answer was, okay, well, this data is anonymized. You know, we've taken out the, you know, the names and it's all fine, it's all good. Uh, so here, that's an example in a CDR, you just replace the number or the name by some random uh, number and it can actually change. So one of the big, one of the big so like breakthroughs in, in research over the past couple of years, I think, has been this the work of uh, so Yves Alexandre de Montjoie, uh, who did his PhD at MIT under Sandy Pentland um, and um, and others, um, and and now is at Imperial College London and part of the Opal project. So it's this this uh, recognition that basically the way we behave and the way we move, etc., is very unique. Meaning that even if you have fully anonymized data, where or even the numbers, like the like the the, the fake numbers, like change. Um, if you have four data points, either in cell phone data or in credit card data, you can you can you can potentially re-identify people, meaning that you don't get you don't find the names, like you don't you know you don't erase the what has been put on top of the names, but it's just that you know that this is a single individual. Um, so from this sort of like ocean of data. Uh, because you can't be here and there at the same time. So there are like patterns that are impossible. So this means that if you have another data set, then you can actually re-identify people. So that's a very big so like change in how we think uh, about the, like the limits of even like pseudonymization. So this means that indeed there is a trade-off. There's a trade-off between uh, the level of aggregation and uh, and, and, and utility, so the usefulness of, of the data. Because the more like aggregated and noisy it is, the safer it is, but at the same time you lose a lot of the value in, in, the, in the data. So that's, I would say, one of the, of the privacy sort of like conundrums uh, of these past uh, couple of years. I will just add also, in terms, if you, so we're talking about privacy. I don't really talk about confidentiality, which is more about like security. I talk more about, or I think more like about, about privacy. So privacy is usually pretty ill-defined. Uh, it's a sort of like vague concept, usually as an afterthought in, in talks. People say, of course, we have to talk about, you know, think about privacy considerations and then ethical considerations, and we don't really know which one it is, or et cetera. So there's, of course, a very long history of research on privacy as a philosophical like concept. Um, I'm not a philosopher, I'm, not, I'm a you know, demographer, uh, yeah, like a development economist, uh, but I'm interested in privacy, so I've read some you know, papers and stuff. And so basically, the first thing I think is that um, it's not only about individual privacy, increasingly the notion of group privacy um, is getting like traction, because the way we behave um, and, and what we consent to share as individuals also tell a lot about other people in our group. Um, so, or, or it can be a tribe, or it can be uh, just a social group, or it can be, uh, so there's also this, this tension that it's not, you can, you can consent to giving personal information, uh, but you, if you give your, your blood for testing, for instance, you give a lot of information about your family, for instance. Um, so that's one of the, let's say, of the, of the, of the change. Um, I've, I've lost, yes. Um, and so anyway, so this leads to other 
considerations of, uh, of sort of like group empowerment and like collective action, et cetera, et cetera which, I will, which I will get to. Also, I think very importantly, so to go back to this, um, I need to speed up because I need 10 minutes for Opal. So um, if we go back to this, uh, to this cartoon. So this cartoon, as I said, was trying to show both the sort of like privacy as in, uh, as in, um, as in well, you're being watched, but also the imbalance of power. And I would say, so historically, or in the literature, there are, there are those two so like complementary conceptions of privacy. One as uh, the right to be left alone. Uh, so I don't want you to know my income. And also privacy as uh, the right to dignity and self-determination. So I choose uh, to, I decide how, what information to reveal about myself. Uh, and I choose also, perhaps increasingly, how this information is going to get used. And often, I think we focus only on the first ones, which is like protecting the data only, et cetera. Um, and I think the second one is at least as, as important. So to let people decide for themselves, it gets to inform consent, et cetera. Uh, but even more than that, uh, what and how their information sh should be used for. So I think we can learn from history. Uh, technologies are always disruptive. So kids uh, went to work in factories and during the Industrial Revolution. We're on this new revolution, uh, which is yeah very much about machines, platform, crowds, uh, and we're trying to sort of like build, create this um, this um, th this future. Um, so we came up a couple of years ago with this um, basically what would be pillars for this positive data enable positive disruption. Uh, being quite political, we say we're going to run against uh, you know tyrants and autocrats uh, around the world, and how can data help that, as opposed to just like reinforce existing power structures, but maybe challenge them, change them. Um, so data, here it's ownership, data ownership. I wouldn't use ownership today, but it's about having people have more say in how their data are used. Uh, it's about algorithmic transparency and accountability. I will get to that. But it's also about testing. It's also about trying out things in the real world to see uh, as carefully as safely, as ethically as possible, but actually trying um, uh, different things. So, and the GDPR is sort of like one, one of the ways like societies are evolving and, and responding to these, to these challenges, um, but I think it's, it's a good you know, like first step, uh, but we can and we will go probably uh, farther than that. But the general philosophy of, a great, of having more consent uh, for from people, um, I think is a, is, a, is, a, is a, of course a sound one. So now about um, Opal in this sort of like concept uh, context. So Opal stands for Open Algorithms. Uh, so it's both uh, a vision, uh, like a paradigm, and and an actual project that they were that we are deploying in different countries around the world. So right now we have a pilot in Colombia and we have a pilot in Senegal. So, and you can see some of the. Some of uh, like it's like the, the you know the, the press, so it's a new paradigm. Uh, the gist of it is to one of those like the DNA is to send open algorithms to the data as opposed to extracting uh, and and exposing uh, the data. And we work with with cell phone data. That's why I focus on CDRs. So the partners are Telefonica in Colombia and Orange Sonatel in uh, in Senegal. So that's sort of like. When I talk about new generation data systems and standards, or privacy promoting uh, data systems and standards, um, in the in the title, so it's not just about I used voluntarily privacy promoting. So it's not just about protecting a privacy. It's about also like promoting privacy as as a philosophical sort of like vision where people have more dignity, have a better, have more cons like say in how their data are are used. Uh, so it's more offensive, like uh, offensive in the sense like it's not only defensive. So essentially the gist of it is um, we're trying to build new standards, technological standards and institutional standards for doing this, like at scale, safely, ethically, etc. So the first one is that you need a private company partner. So it's, um, it's uh, yeah, so it's uh, private companies, Telefonica mentioned, Orange, etc. They all will probably, uh, hopefully be others in other countries. So they accept to have servers installed on their servers, on their data, behind their firewalls. Then there are certified open algorithms that run on their data, and these algorithms are questions. And they ask, what is the population density? 
what, is, what are some origin destinies and matrices. Uh, for the project about, about Mexico, it could be uh, give me just uh, the indicators that I need to answer those questions uh, at a level of granularity that we think is sort of like safe. And then it spits out only the indicators that you need. All right? So that's the sort of like technological part. It's built by MIT and Imperial College. Uh, so it's, you know, to your point, it's at, let's say like as safe, it's the, you know, we think the best you can get uh, today. There is also a governance and, and sort of like institutional component to it, which is that we, are, we want as many people as possible in these countries to be aware, to be informed, to be part of the decision-making process. It's, of course, a difficult task. Um, so we've, we've, we've developed uh, these codes, which are the Council for the Orientation of Development and Ethics. Uh, so it had to work with the you know, pun on words, like the you know, code. Uh, so it's like an oversight, uh, like an IRB body, but a bit more than that. So we have 15 people in each country that look at or will look at the use cases, advise on very sensitive cases, and basically say, yes, we think it's safe, we think this, is, this should not be done, etc. At the end of the day, it is indeed the data controller, so the, the, comp the, telephone, the telecom companies who decide <coughs> what runs on their servers uh, or not, because that's the way it is now. But at least we're trying to like, build this like, ecosystem around it. Um, all right, so I've lost the slides again. <coughs> and I have like five more minutes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so, and we also do um, like trainings and capacity building to try and raise awareness, to try and like, you know, build, so that in the end it's not just something for an elite, uh, that it can be more you know, endogenous uh, and become more, more, more systemic. So, um, yeah, so I, I mentioned some of that. So basically, so it's been, it was funded by, uh, by the French Development Agency for the first two pilots in Colombia and Senegal. The key partners are the national statistical offices uh, of both countries. So uh, DANE in Colombia and INSD in Senegal. Of course, their interests are to get access to those data, uh, they have the SDGs in mind uh, that they need to report on. Uh, they've been trying to get access to the data for many, many years. Uh, they want to get more capacities. They want trainings. They want so th that's the sort of like the political economy of it. Um, so, in the yes, and I'm almost done. So in the future, what we'd like to do so it's really trying to yeah build like these new systems and standards. Maybe in the future. Hopefully we'll do that in 10 countries, maybe 20, maybe 30. Maybe we'll work with banks, uh, with uh, hospitals, very sensitive data, but it could be very rich. You can have like early warning signs of some disease by looking at hospital admissions. Uh, public health systems have those sorts of things in, in, in place, uh, but only usually in high, highly developed countries. Um, so that, that could be one application. So I've put here some uh, countries of Latin America and the Caribbean where we've had initial discussions uh, about deploying uh, Opal as uh, Opal pilots in, in, the, in the near term. So I was going to stop here. I have more slides, um, but I'm not going to go over them. But I have more slides inside. This is the annex. Um, if, or if there are questions about like, a long-term vision of this sort of like human artificial intelligence where like, data could sort of like fuel these more efficient systems uh, to sort of know what works, what doesn't work um, in, uh, in our uh, societies. But I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Emmanuel, uh, for keeping with the time. So